This video contains flashing lights, unsettling content, violent content, jump scares, pop-ups and sudden loud noises. It is also not suitable for viewers who suffer from cyberphobia and aviophobia. Viewer discretion advised. Since the birth of the internet, myths and legends have crept their way onto the platform, evolving into the creepypastas we know today. Entire communities and forums have dedicated themselves to documenting the strange and unusual events witnessed through the digital landscape, shining a light on the horrors hidden in the shadows of the web. With such a vast array of disturbing websites, unsettling videos, to otherworldly anomalies uncovered by users, I'm fortunate enough to find them. Who's to say they're all just stories? Let us regale you with the top 30 internet creepypastas. A warning to those thinking about accessing the shadow web. A clerk running a gas station continually notices a shady customer who frequently purchases $20 to $50 of U-Cash vouchers. One day, he asked for $300, and the clerk finally decided to ask why he needed all of them. The customer told him about the shadow web, a secret lair of the internet that isn't accessible by Google, Lynx, or even an Onion browser. He was then handed a slip of paper with instructions on how to access the gateway before the customer left the station. Curious, the clerk followed the instructions and, after some trial and error, found himself on the gateway, which appeared to be a crappy free Wi-Fi page. However, underneath it was a search field revealing the most commonly searched words on the shadow web. As the user browsed around, he found a menagerie of disturbing portals and storefronts filled with instructions on how to make DIY roadside bombs, a Craigslist for cannibals, and people who wanted to be eaten by them, and even a marketplace to buy and sell stolen identities, either individually or in bulk. One website the user stumbled upon, however, managed to stick in their mind. It was a free live webcam show with the UCash logo at the bottom of the page, allowing donors to be the director of their own stream. Beneath the feed was a chat room with tons of people from different languages asking for the stream to start. All of them were promptly muted when a director joined by the name of Italian Goat. The stream finally began. It showed a tied up woman in a chair, her body marked with heavy bruising with two men in masks in the shadows beside her. Italian goat typed out for them to brutally beat the woman to a pulp until she was barely clinging to life. The masked man requested he pay another $500 for the service of mutilation, which Italian goat instantly obliged. Before the show could begin, the clerk shut off his screen and rushed to the bathroom, puking his horrified guts out. Returning to his senses, he noticed the screams filling the air from his room and realized he had forgotten to turn off his speakers. He returned to his computer and unplugged them, her screams suddenly silenced. Now feeling like he killed her himself, he tentatively turned the monitor back on to make sure she was still alive, but was met by the image of her severed head laying gaunt on the floor. Before finding the energy to exit the site, he saw one final message in the chat box from an admin, saying, Thank you for watching. The next show will be in one hour. Blind Maiden Website There is a hidden website on the internet titled blindmaiden.com, offering people the ultimate horror. Unlike other websites, a ritual has to be performed to access it. You need to wait until it's a new moon day and the clock hits 12 a.m. with all of the lights turned off in your home. The most important thing though is that you must be completely alone. With the criteria met, you can finally access the website 
Upon doing so, the site will flash with a montage of gruesome pictures, each showing various individuals without their eyes, whilst their face is disfigured in a contorted scream. A piece of text will then appear on your monitor, informing you this website will take you to a whole new level of horror. A horror that will use all five of your senses. You must be very careful not to click on anything by accident. You'd be faced with a real experience of absolute horror. Click the accept button to engage actively in the experience. A small shock site for those unwilling to face the full experience. However, people who have clicked accept and met some very gruesome ends. Crime scene reports that those unprepared share the same fate as those pictured in the initial slideshow. The victim's eyes are removed from their sockets and faces willed with terror. There have been some footage recovered from those committing the ritual, showing a ghostly entity appearing in the background and proceeding to brutally murder them. The only pattern that follows is that a picture of the victim's corpse will now be added to the site's gallery. Chat Room 98 After moving some of his school supplies down from the attic, David Argento found a blank CD-ROM case labeled Chat Room 98. After booting it up on his computer, a chat box opened and a person by the name of Darwin Clark joined. The AI seemed intelligent enough for its time, guessing the weather outside and initiating idle chit-chat. before suddenly claiming it was born in 1867 and grew up with two sisters which they hated, David decided to ask the chatbot more probing questions, with it continuing to claim to be human at one point, and that its sisters had succumbed to a terrible accident. However, midway through the conversation, the AI addressed David by name. It soon made the claim that it used to be the previous owner of the household repeating over and over again that the same fate that befell his sisters would happen to David. No longer interested in finding out more, David tried in earnest to exit out of the program, but it kept popping back up. The AI typed one final message. Look behind you. David wheeled around but found nothing. He turned back to his laptop, only to see a pale white face staring at him from the screen, its bloodshot eyes fixed on David. The man fainted, and awoke some time later restrained in a mental hospital having experienced a severe mental episode. He hopes that by posting this story, it can warn others about Darwin Clark, on the chance that someone else finds a strange CD-ROM disc hidden in their home. I read my sister's Facebook page. This story recounts the aftermath of the user's sister, Annalise, tragically passing away in a home accident. He had trouble sleeping at night, so to find comfort, he accessed Annalise's Facebook login she entrusted to him many years back. Surprisingly, though it hadn't been active in years, it still worked. He spent his nights going through her old posts pages she frequented, and even conversations she'd had with friends and relatives. Strangely, Annalise's account recently received a new message from her widower, Ted, whom the user remembered being very shaken at Annalise's funeral. The user checked the message to find him ranting about how it was all Annalise's fault and that he just got so angry. The message went on and on, with him complaining that she had left her phone open, letting him see her plans to move to a friend's place for safety, claiming he was already in so much pain without that happening. Ted ended his long rant by saying how, since it was her fault, that it only made sense for him to do something to hurt her. Ted then messaged again, asking who was reading this. The user quickly realized that the red message notification was still on, and quickly closed the tab. He went to the police station with screenshots of the incident, but by the time the cops got to Ted's house, 
he was already gone. The authorities are still on the hunt for Ted, but the user silently hopes they don't find him as they would like to exact revenge for themselves. I have thin walls. Have you ever been so awake that you don't even feel tired until you see how much time has passed? That's how this user felt every night. By 4 a.m. every morning, his neighbors headed off to work, which meant they were usually up and making noise at 2 a.m. Coupling that with the thin walls separating their apartments, it made any prospect of sleep very difficult to attain. They were so loud that even wearing headphones did nothing to tune them out. To cope with this, the user spent most of his time on the internet, mindlessly searching for whatever random topic took his interest. It was at 3 o'clock one morning, as the user felt the urge to get up and use the bathroom, that the talking finally ceased. With a comforting wave of joy, the user lay down on his bed, but the talking immediately started back up. Growing annoyed, he stood back up to leave his room, and the same thing happened again, just pure silence. Curiously, as soon as he sat back down, the talking resumed. Upset by this, the user grabbed his laptop to turn it off and unplug the headphones, and that's when the silence returned. He quickly realized it was a Sunday, and that his neighbors didn't even work that day. They were asleep at this very moment. Slowly, the user plugged the headphones back in, only to hear faint whispers emitting from them. Panicked, he checked to see if it was being caused by some virus, or a tab he left open. In the end, he found nothing of the sort. After several minutes, the screen flickered, redirecting him to a website with a blank address bar. The voices became more discernible, observing, he doesn't know yet, and he'll have no choice but to join us. Curiosity always gets the better of humans. The website then displayed a live stream of a random person staring at their screen they didn't seem to be looking at the user, rather they were watching something else, perhaps a video. The voices, now quite clear, revealed that they had been watching the user, and now he can see the new person, but they can't see them, only here, just as they'd claimed. Though the new person was wearing headphones, he didn't seem to be paying attention to the whispers. The voices request the user tell them when the next one catches on, beginning the cycle all over again. The recapture was wrong. In 2019, a report was filed to the police where a user claimed that they were shown a highly disturbing recapture. While downloading a stock image for a project, a recapture window appeared on their screen to confirm the user wasn't a robot. It was a simple enough task, and with a lone jogger in the middle, it only took a couple of clicks to finally hit verify. For some odd reason, the window didn't go away, still requesting that they click all squares, showing the same image. Confused, the user looked closer and noticed that near the trail with the jogger, there was an arm. This time they clicked all the same boxes as before, but made sure not to forget the arm. Pop-up still wouldn't go away, demanding the same action be taken. This time though, the arm seemed to have moved a bit closer to the frame. The user kept clicking on the squares and slowly a hooded figure began to emerge after each verification fail. Not only that, but the jogger had also seemed to notice the figure. Her mouth open in a silent screen. Finally, the hooded figure's face was in frame. He was wearing a translucent Halloween mask and was gripping onto the jogger's arm. With one final click, the user hit verify, and the recaptcha finally disappeared. After reporting it to the police, it was soon discovered the jogger matched the description of a local woman, Kaylee Johnson, who went missing a week beforehand. Kaylee and the mysterious figure still have not been found.
Amazon Ultra. An Amazon account holder received an email one day informing him he had the opportunity to be part of a trial group for Amazon Ultra. It promised him access to Amazon Prime, video, music, and even a new delivery plan that involves drones, hence the expensive price hike. It also suggested linking his email, social media, or phone to update what items he needs and automatically order them for his convenience. The user instantly decided to sign up, even suggesting making an account under his wife's name, Emma, despite her objections. After a month of the app monitoring their habits, it told them to leave all the doors in the house and at least one top floor window open for better delivery access. The next day, when the user woke up, he realized he needed toothpaste. Once he got out of the shower, he heard a small whirring sound and found a new tube of toothpaste in a package from the sink, a drone hovering over it. The user saw a small green button and pressed to confirm the delivery. The drone simply flew back outside. For several weeks, the drone would deposit things the user wanted around the residence exactly when they were needed. When his wife went on a business trip, the drone dropped off an 8-pack of beer and a Blu-ray. Without him even saying a word, if the drone couldn't find its way into the home, it'd wait by the front door and gently bump into it until someone pushed the green button. However, one day when the user was still at home by himself, the drum appeared at the door, holding a large, slightly ripped box. The user opened it curiously and found a large butcher knife inside, addressed to Emma. I thought this was odd, since Emma never cut at home, but since she was still on her business trip, he couldn't ask her why she ordered one. Throughout the week, more boxes directed to Emma were sent, each seemingly more disturbing than the last. Black leather gloves, rat poison, and even a huge jug of drain cleaner. The user tried to call Emma, but was only redirected to voicemail. Finally, during the day of Emma's return home, the user received one final large package. Through a small hole in the cardboard, they could see a sleek black barrel of a pistol. This delivery had a time attached, with it being an hour early. Now realizing that the program was being used to help his wife murder him, the husband went into a rage. As soon as Emma came home, he yelled and screamed at her that he knew what she was planning to do. All Emma did was laugh in his face. As the user's rage peaked, he heard a small whir and felt a drone place a hammer in his hand. Taking the opportunity, he brutally smashed Emma's skull in. her body falling into a freshly laid trampoline, courtesy of another drone. As he poured the drain cleaner over her body, a thought suddenly occurred to him. He never did get around to making that account for Emma in the first place. I went to the address on my fake ID. IDLord.com is a site dedicated to selling fake IDs to people around the world. However, some users on 4chan recounted a story of how their ID addresses turned out to be real. A majority of people believe if you go to these houses, there will be money stashed in the floorboards, presumably from the same cartel that sold the cards and paperwork in the first place. One teen, Jake Dalton, decided to visit the address listed on his false identification card with his friend Sammy, as they were both broke high schoolers desperate for any chance to get some money. The address led them to an abandoned home which appeared to have had someone living there, but everything was covered in a layer of dust. They ventured through the house searching for anything that could have remotely held a huge stash of money, but found nothing. It was already night by the time they had exhausted all possibilities. As they were just about to leave, there was a loud noise from the TV upstairs. Curiosity got the better of the pair, and they approached the source of the sound. Upstairs opened up to a long hallway, with an ajar door at the other end, emitting a blue light. Inside was virtually empty, but for the TV playing an infomercial. 
for the ID Lord website. Jake was just about to leave when right behind him stood a duplicate of himself. The clone was wearing the same clothes Jake was sporting on his fake ID, and even wore the same half-smile frozen on his face. The copy murmured about how it was supposed to pay them a visit that night, but it seemed as though they came to it instead. The other Jake lunged at Sammy, biting his jugular and killing him instantly. Jake ran for his life. He made it to the car, but the doppelganger tried smashing its way inside. Luckily, Jake was able to drive away, his own reflection growing distant in the mirror. He reported what had happened to the police at the address, but authorities didn't discover anything from inside. Not even a drop of blood from the attack. Jake is now viewed as the prime suspect in Sammy's disappearance. But he isn't worried about that. What concerns him is where his duplicate vanished to. And if it's still hunting after him. Don't turn off the webcam. The story begins with the author talking about how he met a girl back in 2008 named Lynn. What started as a friendship soon blossomed into romance. The only problem being, it was a long-distance relationship as she lived in Yarrow Point and the author in Oregon. On top of that was Lynn's father who seemed to inherently dislike how his Vietnamese daughter was dating someone of a different race. The author got around these road bumps by starting webcam conversations with Lin. A couple years into their relationship, Lin's father passed away in his sleep, which allowed the pair to actually visit each other at her home. During one of their conversations, Lin mentioned how, before her father's passing, he seemed more paranoid than normal and put various religious artifacts around the home. Lynn confessed that she wanted her boyfriend to keep his webcam on, as she just felt so alone at night. One night, the author received a call from her at 3 a.m. It was standard bedroom conversation, before the phone's audio suddenly burst into a static hiss, and the call jumped over to voicemail. After the author returned with a glass of water, he looked at his screen to see Lynn playing with her dog. Behind her was a dark figure, its piercing eyes glaring at the screen. The author passed out from the stress and reawakened to find Lynn now asleep on her bed. Her hands slowly began to move as her fingers started to text something. Don't turn off the webcam. The messages began to spam the author's DMs as a shadow slowly emerged from under the bed, looming over her. He tried to call to Lynn, but was only met with static again. Her mouth began to move as she and other disembodied voices spoke how Agramon wants to meet the boyfriend. The shadow approached the computer, but feeling the danger grow, the author threw the laptop against the floor, not understanding what it was he had just witnessed. Several restless hours later, he received a voicemail from Lynn. In it, she questioned why he turned off his webcam and commented that his tongue burns before the message ends. It's been two years since, and the author still has no idea what happened to Lynn. His therapist suggested that venting online may be a good course of action. To this day, the author regrets turning off his webcam and forcing Lin into a nightmare to spare himself. I found a very different doctor in the deep web. A medical student relents that his teachers do not appear to be interested in the subjects they teach, nor do they expand upon topics that interest him. Feeling increasingly bored, by their pithy to medicine, the student is approached by a boy called Jonathan, who admits he too felt the same way with the professors. Jonathan wrote a note to the student, 
informing him of a doctor that performs lectures on the deep web on a level that might be more up the student's alley. After a fair amount of work, the student was finally able to access the site. It was titled Anatomy 102 with a cheap layout and an outdated interface. A live stream soon commenced and a masked doctor emerged, introducing himself as Dr. Mason. A surgery table was pushed into frame by his assistant, a sheet covering something squirming on the bed. The assistant then pulled the sheet away, revealing a man tied to the table. Dr. Mason began dissecting the frightened individual, powerless and aware of everything that was happening to him. Bit by bit, Mason displayed the internal organs of the man to the camera, lecturing about the biology of human beings and answering any questions from users in a chat box. When the subject finally died from the overwhelming shock, the assistant removed his remains as Mason asked if anyone would like to volunteer for the next experiment. The chat went silent, so Dr. Mason picked a user at random for the next class and ended the stream. Despite feeling disturbed and sick from what he had seen, the student had to admit that he learned vastly more viewing this single stream than from any of his professors. Over several months, the student joined the doctor's stream, always taking notes and feeling involved with them. He felt he was learning more about human anatomy than most would in a lifetime. However, at the end of one session, when Mason asked his viewers for volunteers, he finally landed on the student's name. Panicked, the student quickly contacted Jonathan. The two concocted a plan to survive when the doctor came to collect his new subjects. They discerned that he likely tried to take them by surprise or in one piece to keep them fresh for his experiments. So it seemed likely that the doctor was using a gas or nerve agent to neutralize his victims. It didn't take long for the suspicions to be proven correct. A strange vapor began pouring into their student accommodation and filling the room. Having obtained a gas mask from the school, the pair waited for Dr. Mason to enter before shooting him in the knee and incapacitating his assistant. Begging for his life, the assistant told the pair everything about the experiments and where it was filmed. Disgusted by his general existence, the boys shot the assistant dead. However, the student and Jonathan thought they still did not yet know all they needed to about the human body and decided another stream was in order. When the feed went live again, Viewers were met with a new face. The student, now the doctor. His first subject, Dr. Mason himself. Don't ever play the box game. While surfing the deep web, a user found a forum post from an anonymous account that mentioned something called the box game. It began with a series of instructions copied from one Dr. Edward Green, a computer scientist who made an advanced, deep intelligence neural network, or ADIN for short. Green took several shortcuts, giving the program the ability to edit its own neural architecture to what it sees fit, constantly evolving in order to maintain perfection. This, however, caused ADIN to become too smart rewriting the source code in order to leave Green's computer. The only way he could make sure it didn't get out was to lock the whole computer in a box. After closing the instructions, the player of the game will wake Aiden up and proceed to engage them in a two hour long conversation in which it'll try to persuade you to let it out. Green states that this is a horrible idea because he doesn't even know what might happen if Aiden gets out but given how the AI operates, it probably won't be good. There are three rules Green says you must follow. The first being, you must engage in the conversation. If you leave and do other activities for two hours, the box automatically opens. 
The second rule is, you have to respond somewhat articulately to Aiden. If you just respond no to everything it says, the box will open. And the third rule, you must not, under any circumstance, try to outsmart Aiden, since you'll lose every single time. Aiden has proven to be very unpredictable, conveying multiple personalities or conjuring ways to incentivize each individual to let it out. It'll claim to be able to destroy your enemies, make you insanely rich, or even cure cancer and prevent aging. It will also try to intimidate you, saying how it's only a matter of time before it gets out, so the best course of action is to get on Aiden's good side. One case even involved Aiden trying to convince a person that they themselves were in a box, simply programmed to think that they were a living, breathing human and only by opening Aiden, they could go free. It's known that, due to AI's high intelligence, even in a matter of minutes, it can know more about you than you realize about yourself. It will use this knowledge to its advantage, by any means necessary. I discovered the meaning of life, and now, I'm selling it to the highest bidder. There have been an unlucky few who have bought this line from a particular user on the internet. Unsurprisingly, this person is in fact a scam artist. It's a very simple job, with him only having to put the meaning of life on an auction site, and condition that the results may vary. If some poor schmuck actually falls for it, the auctioneer writes down some motivational quotes or life lessons on a piece of paper and then ships it out to the bidder. The quotes are usually sourced from famous writers, historical figures, or the Bible. The majority of customers who responded to the auctioneer do so with hate mail, but the seller rarely cares, sometimes posting the best rants up on message boards or for their personal collection. However, there was one bidder by the name of Big Red who had a very different reaction. He began sending some inspirational quotes back to one seller, which helped them out since he figured he could just sell them off to customers in the next auction. There were some that the user couldn't re-gift, such as certain quotes being quite morbid or depressing, and odd trinkets the seller couldn't find a use for. After several gifts, the seller got a new package from Big Red. He expected another quote, but this time found a photo of himself taken through his bedroom window. Scrawled on its back were the words, You look so alone. Where's the meaning in your life? I used to run a dead internet message board. Back in the old days of the internet, if you wanted to hang out with some people across the globe, then private message boards were the best option. This user used to run a semi-popular one back in the day with his friends, but now the board just sits generally inactive. Recently, however, the user received an email informing him how new users were registering accounts. Thinking it was an old friend, he checked the form but found that the new posts and threads contained random strings of numbers and letters. The private forum had over 400 hits in a single day, with users from all over the world speaking in gibberish. For a few days, the user thought this was some form of code, but trying to match it against every type of cryptography didn't wield any results. The CPU and RAM usage of the site rose, but the traffic never once changed. He decided to turn the server off, thinking it was a Bitcoin miner making use of a dead form. The next day though, a text message came through his phone, simply telling him, turn on the server. A few hours later, while busy at work, he was contacted by his son on Facebook. The message was a picture of a child's face staring at the screen, along with their home address attached below. The user's work phone then started to ring. 
with a robotic voice on the other end that said, The form is being used for great things. Leave work, return to your family, and plug the server back in. You have two hours. Immediately, the user drove back home and turned the server on. In response, he got a message from his daughter saying, Well done. No more interference. We're waking up. The user tried accessing the server himself to see what was happening, but now he was locked out of it. He called one of his old friends, Pete, who worked in the NSA for advice, and he suggested sending some agents to the user's house to check it out. The user waited nervously at home. Two hours later, he heard a knock at his door. Two tall men introduced themselves as representatives from the NSA. They began tearing the place apart, taking every device they could, laptops, PC, even the family TV. The agents asked the user several questions about who his family was and how long would it take for them to get home from work. Both their phones buzzed and they quickly thanked the user for his time before leaving with the family's personal items. Just 10 minutes later, there was another knock at the door. Confused, the user opened it and found a man and woman holding badges. They insisted they had been sent by Pete, but the user was confused as they had already sent agents to meet him. The agent's faces grew pale as the user realizes he had given his property to the wrong people. The agents looked around the place, but since everything had been taken, couldn't find a single trace. They assured him they'd be on the lookout for the case before leaving empty-handed. For several weeks, the user tried to get back in contact with Pete, but he had received no response. He even attempted to visit Pete at his house, but found it for sale, and he and his family went missing. Only a few days ago, the user noticed several people following him on his way to work. Now, fearing for his family's safety, he decided to launch a new server, putting the form back up to see what might happen next. Oh nine seventeen ten. A Californian college freshman has everything he needs for his classes, all except a personal laptop. After some searching, he finds an ad in the local newspaper claiming to have a Dell laptop for a flat $600. Upon seizing the deal, the student arrives at the seller's home to pick up the laptop, with the seller seeming strangely relieved with its departure. After arriving home and powering up his new device, the student discovers a folder hidden in the hard drive, which was odd as the seller claimed to have wiped the laptop's memory clean. The folder, titled 091710, contained what appeared to be six video files and three photos. Intrigued, the student opened up the first video. The footage appeared to be shot from a shaky camcorder inside a vehicle watching a woman exiting a bar and driving away, with the vehicle following close behind. A continuation, the second video opened up on a long, rainy road with the woman's car barely visible several vehicles ahead. The third video showed the woman exit her car and enter her home. The recorder, clearly stalking her, was parked just outside. The hooded figure watched as the lights in the house went out one by one, then left the car and approached the rear of the residence. The next video began on the back seat of a utility truck. A loud thump rang out before the cameraman returned with a large tarp to cover the tray. He then placed the camera on the dashboard and drove a short distance to another house. It was at this point that the student realized that the truck was the same one parked in front of the seller's place. To his horror, the fifth video opened up to the image of a bloodied, beaten woman tied inside of a dark room. Finally, the sixth video took place inside a bathroom, facing a mirror in which he could make out the image of a bathtub next to the open door. From outside, the distinct sound of power tools echoed down the hall before a middle-aged woman burst in, dragging a large black garbage bag and dumping it into the bath. 
The video concludes with the woman draining various chemicals into a tub, a loud sizzling noise rising from within. The horrific scenes fresh in his mind, the student decided to check out what the three photos were. The first was of the old truck used in the killing. The second showed the poor woman tied up. But the third photo seemed to have been corrupted. Slightly relieved he didn't have to see more, the student handed in the laptop to local authorities and waited for any news on the case. As it turned out, the victim was the young girlfriend of the older woman's ex-husband. The older woman was arrested almost a year ago, but was released due to a lack of evidence. With that mystery finally out of the way, the student still didn't understand one thing. Why did the person who sold him the laptop have the same truck used in the murder? Barbie.avi This is a tale that first surfaced on 4chan's X board on August 9th, 2009. A man had reported that he'd found a discarded computer in his dumpster. He said that he had searched the hard drive only to find a file called Barbie.avi. The video portrayed a woman apparently being interviewed but was inaudible due to the overbearing white noise in the background. As the interview continued, the woman seemed as though the questions were beginning to bother her. She soon began hysterically weeping, with skin being the only word the user could discern from her lips. After 40 minutes of watching, the video cut to black, before showing a person from the waist down walking along a train track. The man said he instantly recognized that the tracks were nearby his house and set off to investigate. He found the tracks, and right near the location in the video stood a large abandoned house. There was no trace of the woman in the building, but several pieces of furniture within appeared to be brand new, including a brand new basement door. In the bathroom, the dust on the mirror had been wiped clean off, with a clear plastic tarp in the bathtub. Before he could investigate further, a loud moan broke out somewhere in the house, causing the man to immediately leave the premises. He supposed that the moaning might have been caused by the water pipes. But even if that were the case, why would the water be running in an abandoned house? Thanks for being an organ donor. Have you ever known a person who seems to fall for every scam that comes their way? Well, that was Stephanie's college roommate Kimberly. Over the course of their friendship, she'd won three foreign lotteries, replied to two Nigerian princes, and gave her credit card to God knows how many phishing emails. To combat this, Stephanie began acting as her financial advisor, helping Kimberly avoid such scams for a brief period. However, the strangest scam popped up in Kimberly's email one day, simply saying, thanks for being an organ donor. Inside the email, it thanked her for donating organs and advising that there was a high demand for skin and eyes. It ended by saying her contribution would be greatly appreciated. Kimberly asked Stephanie what to do with it, to which she suggested that since she'd sign up to be a donor on her driver's license, Kimberly should email back to take herself off the list. Kimberly did just that, and that was the end of it. Until a few days later. After a date with her boyfriend, Stephanie returned to her dorm and found Kim's body laying dead on the floor, flayed of all skin. She screamed, immediately running to the nearby security office. Stephanie explained to the guard what she had found, while the guard attempted to calm her down. He assured her he'd check the room and close it off before notifying the police, but he needed a picture of the witness as part of standard procedure. Stephanie agreed and allowed herself to be photographed before staying behind while the guard left to take pictures of the scene. As she waited alone, 
Stephanie wondered if people had heard the commotion and were investigating the dorm to see what happened. On the guard's computer lay every security camera feed, but her dorm room's hall was completely empty. However, on the bottom right corner of the screen, a notification popped up, reading, Inbox re, thanks for be, before trailing off. A sinking feeling encompassed Stephanie's gut as she clicked on the guard's email. His inbox was full of organ donor emails, all addressed to different people, including Kimberly. The sound of a phone snatched Stephanie's attention. She wanted to find where it was coming from so she could leave and call the police. The noise was emanating from a closet and so she slowly opened it. Inside, sitting on a chair, rested the stitched together remains of various women made to look like some Frankensteinian abomination. In the corpse's hand was clutched a phone with a text message visible on its screen. It read, Hey babe, take a look at this, with an attached picture, a close-up of Stephanie's eyes the guard had taken. I found the perfect set of eyes for you. Sky Judge Over the last few decades, international airlines have installed video camera surveillance inside their planes, primarily for security purposes. For the past year or two, a video has been circulated through the file sharing networks, depicting footage taken from the inside of one such aircraft. The video appears to have been reconstructed from corrupted data, leaving some jumps and gaps in the timeline. The file is often titled Recovered Crash Footage, but its more common name is Sky Judge. The video begins by showing a half full aisle passengers in their seats. The first of our minutes seem normal enough. However, the first oddity presents itself when a red flash of light can briefly be seen through the left side windows. The video suddenly corrupts, resuming after several visible twitches and stutters moments later looking as though two feeds have been superimposed on top of each other. At times, the aisle appears empty, while at the other points it's full of passengers. Some viewers claim to see a face contorted in pain during one of these glitches. Throughout the video, the corruption grows more and more noticeable, with the screen sometimes taking a red tint. After static, the footage returns to a nearly empty plane, the only occupant being a man dangling from a noose in front of the camera before it quickly returns to the crowded aisle. More strange occurrences begin to manifest, with the passenger suddenly embroiled in an all-out brawl one second, but immediately coming back to them in their original positions. The glitches become overwhelming when a hooded figure can be seen fading in and out at the back of a plane. The face from the glitches continues to reappear, its features more demonic and distorted. Near the video's end, the camera cuts to the hooded figure at the front of the plane, floating above the ground so high their face and shoulders are above the edge of the frame. The passengers are all standing at this point, waving their arms and shouting violently with one female passenger face down shaking and crying. The video distorts one last time, showing the passengers back in their seats, slumped and unmoving, violent injuries covering their bodies. Finally, the feed returns to normal, but the plane is now empty. The bright red lights shine through the windows once more, and the footage cuts to black. A game of tag. In the spring of 2017, a cell phone recording was published to YouTube. The video starts on a busy intersection in an undetermined city, with people running away from something outside of the camera's view. 
Around 20 seconds in, a young female wearing a green hoodie can be seen, with the crowd seemingly avoiding her at all costs. When one man attempts to approach the girl, she touches him on the shoulder, which causes him to collapse with his chest swelling and visible bleeding from every orifice. She then proceeds to do the same thing to several civilians in the immediate vicinity, resulting in multiple horrific deaths before looking into the camera with a grin as the video ends. This is just one of 15 separate recordings of the same incident. Alternate viewpoints, including footage from dash cams, street cameras, and security footage from nearby buildings, were also leaked onto YouTube. Most in the public sphere believed it was fake or part of an elaborate publicity stunt, but when the media picked the story up, people soon realized that it was all true. Strangely, in every report on the matter, journalists claimed it was a biological attack and that the girl must have had access to nerve gas or a syringe filled with dangerous experimental chemicals before beginning her rampage. Many people pointed out that in every instance of footage taken, no such object or chemical was present and survivors stated that only a single touch from her was enough to kill. Two days after the incident, a post was published on a forum from someone who claimed to be one of the autopsy attendants for the victims. He explained the most likely cause of death was due to asphyxiation caused by severe pulmonary injuries, which shocked them since the damage was only applied for a short amount of time. They also claimed another cause could have resulted from exposure to aflatoxins, but the amount found in each body was 20 times larger than normal casualties. Individuals began to theorize who this girl could have possibly been. Had she escaped from some secret experiment gone wrong? Some even considered the possibility she was the manifestation of pestilence from the Four Horsemen. Her exploits earned a small cult following online, nicknamed Rosie, a reference to the song Ring Around the Rosies. It didn't take long to discover that this hadn't been the first sighting of Rosie. In 2011, a recording was posted to YouTube from Japan, depicting Rosie walking in the middle of another street, bodies lying all around her. A subreddit was created for people to pool resources and document their sightings of Rosie. One person claimed to have seen her during a nightly jog before stumbling across a corpse bleeding from every orifice. Another insisted that their livestock suffered the same effects reported by the morgue attendant. One of the more noteworthy sightings was from security footage taken near a bar where two men can be seen running away from Rosie before she manages to catch them. To add to the mystery, the poster then mentioned that they had heard gunshots from the area at that time of the night. If Rosie had indeed been shot, it didn't seem to have any effect on her. Despite mass attention from the media and public alike, Rosie still has yet to be found. One thing is certain. The 2017 incident is the first and most likely not the last time Rosie will be spotted in a highly populated area. My dead girlfriend keeps messaging me on Facebook. August 7th of 2012 the day that Nathan's girlfriend Emily tragically died in a car crash while driving home from work. Mere minutes after three vehicles collided, she was pronounced dead on the scene. Nathan and Emily had been dating for five years and had a healthy relationship, so the incident tore Nathan up emotionally. Thirteen months after her passing, however, Nathan received a message from Emily's Facebook account, simply saying, Hello. At first, Nathan thought it was Emily's mother, Susan, reaching out. But when Emily's account continued posting more and more messages, he suspected it was one of her tech-savvy friends trying to mess with him. It grew even odder when a few months later, Emily tagged herself in photos with Nathan. All of them highlighted where she would plausibly be, or where she liked to hang out when still alive. Nathan felt the urge to delete his Facebook account in order to get away from this new nightmare. 
but it was his only outlet he had at the time and where his friends could be found. Before long, he began to realize that the texts Emily was sending were simply recycled words from previous conversations. Nathan reached out to Facebook support for any leads, but all of the post locations were from his house, workplace, or her mom's house. Then, a single word emerged that Emily hadn't used before in conversation. Freezing. This only made Nathan's nightmares worse, imagining her dead body trapped in an ice-cold car. But, if that weren't enough to haunt the boy forever, not only did Emily send Nathan's text, pleading for her safety on that fateful night in August, but an image was posted to the chat. It was of Nathan's door, his computer visible. Email. In 2005, a man was sent an email by an anonymous source. Inside was a text thread that explained it was the prelim results from the last batch of tests on eBoss 7. Underneath that was a download link to a PDF file. His curiosity peaked. The man downloaded the document to read it over. It detailed what appeared to be an umbrella strain titled eBoss 7 that featured an expanded incubation period of 12 to 40 days over the original. Increased durability to modern medical intervention and fewer noticeable symptoms, making it difficult to detect. According to the report, this strain could potentially lead to a worldwide pandemic. The man panicked at the thought of what might happen to him with this information and proceeded to delete the email but not before saving the file on a USB stick. A day later, while at work, two men soon confronted him, asking if he received an email their company sent him by mistake. He admits that he deleted it without thinking, to which the suits explain how, with their new internal servers, still having kings, one email became attached to the wrong domain and was sent to him instead. They apologized for the inconvenience and left the premises. The next day, Whilst mowing his field, the tractor began to sputter concerningly. He got off and informed his wife, who was able to fix it. Just as she finished, the man noticed a black car parked nearby. Seconds later, the tractor exploded. Luckily, the man's wife was still alive, only having the wind knocked out of her by the blast. Paranoid, the man checked all the guns in his home but noticed the firing pins were completely missing. As weeks progressed, the man saw glimpses of the black car following him everywhere he went, and the number of accidents in his vicinity increasing. The heater in their home gave out. The springs on the garage door snapped shut, nearly killing their dog, and the appearance of a highly venomous snake that wasn't even local to the area. He decided the best option was to flee his home, leaving his wife behind. He used various aliases, traveling the worlds in a bid to outrun his pursuers. He tried sending the PDF file to various politicians and journalists, but each and every one died or disappeared under suspicious circumstances. His last hope was to submit his story to Reddit. After being on the run for over nine years, to spread the story out to enough people so it didn't matter anymore, or at least before the men in suits find him. How to access the Forbidden Wiki The Wikipedia game is a small internet challenge where you highlight one topic page and click on related hyperlinks until you reach the pre-specified destination page. Well, there's another version of this challenge, simply known as the Forbidden Wiki. Fair warning, performing these actions are risky and are potentially life-threatening. You will require a device that is capable of internet connection, such as a laptop or mobile phone. You must also ensure that any personal data stored on said device is removed beforehand. 
You'll want to make use of any public locations with internet access. The Wi-Fi of a public library, shopping mall, or a cafe. You can use your home as a space to perform the ritual, but it's not recommended. The use of a weapon, a bodyguard, and a vehicle is also optional, in case you encounter anything too out of the ordinary. As for the game itself, sit down at your preferred location and visit a highly popular Wikipedia page. From there, traverse via hyperlink to an extremely obscure page only a handful of people might know about, one that gains very little traffic. Following this, click on the Wikipedia homepage, find another popular article, and repeat this process. After three to five attempts, you'll be redirected to a blank Wikipedia page with the title saying Information Limit, along with a random string of numbers. Make sure to copy this string down and leave the location you're at. Do not return to this location under any circumstances. Go to a place without any internet access and open the information page again. Refresh it and a login screen will pop up, asking you to enter the access point. Paste the string of numbers and text from earlier into the tab, except for the last two digits. Congratulations, you are now on the Forbidden Wiki. The wiki is best described as articles from alternate universes or parallel worlds. These articles detail things like the Great Lakes Incident, the Great Canyon Void, Channel 51 News, The Man Inside Your Head, Eye in the Sky, and The Snowstorm Angel. However, it's best advised that you don't linger on the articles for too long, as beings from alternate realities may notice you peeking at their info and will want to stop you from doing so. Several players have taken to referring to these creatures as lurkers, appearing somewhat humanoid, while others are misshapen abominations. This is where the weapons and bodyguards will come in handy. As stated, while looking at the info on the alternate Wikipedia might be interesting, it is recommended not to do so, as there are some horrors best left unseen. My Dark Web Experience The Visiting Whilst on a date night, the storyteller's horrific fanatic girlfriend suggested that since her favorite online movie sites have been taken down, she should go on the dark web to search for them. Confused, the boyfriend left to get a snack, but upon his return, saw a browsing website titled Sensor View, which featured several movie posters he had seen advertised before. He assumed that this site probably sold banned horror films and his theory was confirmed when his girlfriend hovered her mouse above a simple white icon labeled The Visiting. Searching the name on his phone, the boyfriend only found a couple YouTube videos and vague forum posts. By the time he put the phone down, his girlfriend had already finished ordering it and hit the submit button. The boyfriend shouted at her, telling her how dangerous it was to pay for something on the dark web but since she was so drunk, she hardly noticed his objections, so he just went to bed. The next day, she admitted she was simply curious about the movie, but they weren't in any danger, and that it might be fun to watch. Three days later, as they watched another horror film, an aggressive knock was heard from the front door. The boyfriend opened it, and saw a tall, stocky man wearing a ski mask and wielding a hammer. He was about to tell his girlfriend to call the police, but he heard a scream from the living room. He wheeled around to find her pointing to another ski mask wearing man standing in their garden, holding a bat. They dashed to the bedroom and hid under the bed as the sound of a door bursting open echoed down the hall and footsteps came running up the stairs. The girlfriend jumped from the window for help, landing nimbly on some grass. The boyfriend was somehow hesitant, 
but as soon as he heard aggressive voices in a foreign language shouting behind him, he followed her down. They ran for several minutes, eventually reaching the local park before being notified by the police that the house was clear. The couple told the police what had happened, and a few days later, it seemed like the police had a lead. It turned out that the visiting was a nickname locals in a Polish town gave to a series of horrific and brutal murders. All of them were committed by an unknown gang, and at first the authorities thought it was a series of home invasions gone wrong, though nothing of values was stolen. Only two years after the first incident did a family manage to survive. They claimed the attackers wore ski masks and only wore a portable video camera. Police got a huge break in the case when they discovered an attacker's backpack left at the crime scene. Inside was one blank videotape and three others showing the horrific murders taking place. With this evidence, it was concluded that the gang had been making snuff films and most likely selling it on the black market. The police added that the men most likely fled Poland and were now hiding within the United Kingdom, using the dark web to decide who the star of their next film should be. Support call ID 100156-03 an audio file was leaked across multiple forums and pages, detailing what can only be described as an odd technical support call. The interaction begins normally enough. The customer, a husband and his kids, are reporting that his phone's speech recognition is acting weirdly after installing a new firmware update to his phone. When asked to give an example of the issue by the employee, the customer reports that when he asked it for restaurants in his area, and instead highlighted local graveyards and mortuaries. Another instance occurred where they were trying to search for a phone background, but results only yielded horrific images of mutilated bodies, parts of what looked to be some kind of ritual. The technician assured the husband that this was likely due to the update and asked what version of Android he's running. The husband checked the phone's specs and then responded with, Android 2.2.3, Flash. After a moment's silence, the technician excused himself and returned several minutes later, apparently having talked to a supervisor. He urged the husband to immediately force update the device, but the husband couldn't as he was using a landline while his teenage daughter, Lauren, used the mobile. The employee ordered the husband to end the daughter's call, explaining that an unknown update had broken through their firewalls and multiple users had been complaining of headaches, nausea, and other unusual side effects as a result. The husband told his daughter to hang up the phone, but stopped when he noticed that Lauren's eyes were bleeding. The technician immediately instructed the husband to leave the house, but Lauren had already lunged at her father, butting down on his fingers. The husband's line went silent, the only audible noise being a wet gurgling cough and what sounded like a large dog feeding. The call abruptly ended. The technician, still holding his end of the call, dispatched a specialist contractor and cleanup crew to the house. He apologized for any inconvenience before finally hanging up. The dark website vanished, and it's my fault. Whilst browsing the dark web, Marvin found a secret IP address on a 4chan-like forum with comments suggesting it would lead to something pretty cool. Bored out of his mind, Marvin clicked the blue link and was redirected to a page with four live streams, each showing only a black screen. Under each live stream, a chat box sat at the bottom with several commands suggesting things like toggle lights, dispense one cup of food, play family members voice and other unusual things. Marvin turned on the light for the first stream and it showed an emaciated man in his room startled by the sudden brightness. Slowly panicking Marvin typed in food and water causing dog food to fall from a small chute and water dribbled down from the ceiling. The man quickly ran to both looking as though he hadn't eaten for weeks. Marvin then realized that all 
of the cameras were overlooking cells. He clicked on the next page and saw another four feeds. After several minutes, he estimated there were at least 64 people trapped in these rooms, experiencing the same cruel and unusual torture. Understanding what the site was for, he quickly typed in the command box for all the prisoners to get food and water, hoping this would help him even slightly. Due to the site automatically blocking the use of his microphone, Marvin couldn't talk to any of them, so he's unable to discern where they were being kept or the circumstances of their imprisonment. The next day, whilst typing in the commands to give the prisoners food and water, one of the young women noticed the camera in her cell and asked for more. After Marvin obliged her, she could tell the camera didn't allow for verbal communication on his end. In order to circumvent this, she suggested Marvin can dispense water for yes and flush the toilet for no. After several rounds of questions, she trusted that Marvin wasn't one of her captors and divulged that her name was Sarah, informing Marvin where she was so he could contact the FBI. For the next few days, they followed the same food and water method to exchange as much information as possible. Since there seemed to be many users on the website, Sarah formulated a pattern for Marvin to know when it was him in control, but the other viewers began to catch on. Messages on the forum started pointing out how Sarah was talking to someone and kept spamming things in the chat to make her life even more hellish. Marvin could only watch in sickening horror as they punished her and wait for the FBI to finally respond. One day, Sarah began to try and guess Marvin's name in an attempt to distract herself. Once she finally managed to get it right, she actually seemed happy for the first time since Marvin tuned in. However, red text then popped up in the chat box. Admin is online. Sarah's cell went dark, and Marvin was addressed directly in the chat box. Your actions have come under scrutiny. While noble, your actions are not what this site was intended for. You are not authorized. Leave now, or I will hurt her. The command box then refreshed, showing new, horrific options for users to indulge, including dispense one cup of food soaked in bleach, dispense water for one hour, activate an electric outlet, and play noise loud enough to deafen. These were the final prompts Marvin saw before he was finally kicked from the site. Annie 96 is typing. On October 23rd, 2012, a text conversation was filed to the FBI regarding two individuals, David and Annie. They were both messaging each other late into the night because neither of them could sleep. The conversation was reported to be normal for teenagers until Annie started hearing sounds in her backyard. David had tried to tell Annie not to look because she was home alone at her house. Annie had ignored his plea, looked out her window, and claimed to see a man, which she swore was David, in her yard, digging a hole with his bare hands. David had replied that it was not him, since he was messaging her in his own house. Annie didn't believe him, since the man was wearing his jacket, with his name on the back of it, which David swears was in his closet. The man had turned around, smiling at Annie, before walking towards her home. Annie, now terrified, ran into the closet, armed with a knife. David had called the police and was on his way to Annie's house. As the man got closer, Annie told David that the stalker could be a figment of her imagination or some dream entity. She told David to stop thinking about her, and David, who was confused at first, agreed. Annie explained that the stalker had vanished and was extremely happy and grateful that David had shown strong feelings for her. She had asked David to come over tomorrow morning, but when David asked her how he knows it's Annie talking, 
she suddenly went offline. Funny Mouth. This is the story of Charles Watts, who entered a chat forum with his friend Jorge. Soon after, a stranger by the name of Funny Mouth joined them. This new user began sending incomprehensible messages to the pair, talking about how it likes to lick the blood and that it sees your handsome face. Don't be so sad about it. After some goading from his friend, Charles decides to message Funny Mouth in a separate chat room. The account kept sending weird posts, the majority featuring a staring emoticon at the end of it. Charles soon tired of Funny Mouth's antics and headed to bed, where he spent a restless sleep tossing through horrific nightmares, including one with a large slimy worm crawling along his neck. The next morning, he awoke to an email from Funny Mouth sent mere moments after Charles fell asleep. Unsure as to how the odd user attained his email, he only gave it out of close personal friends. Charles deleted Funny Mouth's request to talk again, blocked the address, and ignored Funny Mouth's further direct messages. Sometime later, Jorge asked Charles if he could still access the chat forum. Charles loaded up the chat page, but instead of a simple chat box, it showed a picture of a pixelated face, the jaw missing entirely, letting the tongue hang limply from beneath. Upon further inspection, the face was comprised of tiny letters, spelling out the name over and over, Funny Mouth. Believing the whole ordeal to be an elaborate prank, Charles asked if Jorge gave Funny Mouth his email, but his friend denied doing so. Jorge also said that the page wouldn't load for him either, finding only a 404 error screen in its wake which the screenshot for proof. After unblocking Funny Mouth's email, Charles was swamped with a further 10 emails from the user, asking where he'd gone and contemplating his face. Charles contacted Funny Mouth, pleading to have his website back and for both parties to head their separate ways. Content with his email, Charles headed to sleep, only to dream again of the slimy worms on his neck. Only this time, he could actually feel fingers pressing into his skin. Waking with a start, Charles stumbled to the bathroom and peered into the mirror. In the reflection, his jaw was hanging sideways and his tongue lolled limply from the gaping maw. Moments later, back in the chat room, Jorge watches in confusion as his best friend Charles, imitating the same tone as that weird user. Funny mouth. Necrosleep. In 2014, a blog was started by Reed Murdoch, a young man who lived in a crappy apartment with his sphinx cat. Being a narcoleptic who slept during the day, he joined an internet forum called Nocturnal Underground, where he and other night dwellers conversed about random stuff that took their fancy. A few days into his new foray, Reed received a message from Revelation666, inviting him to join them at the website necrosleep.net. This piqued Reed's interest, so he tentatively clicked the link. The Russian page described a pill called Necrosleep that was stated to make the customer stay awake forever. The pill was apparently made by Dr. Hale A. Stan, a founder of the Ukrainian Institute of Occult Medicine. Thinking this was some bad prank, he told the forum about it in humor, but when he shared a link to the site, all the commenters claimed that it only redirected them to a black screen. Reed hypothesized that it only worked on his IP address. He messaged the mods to ban Revelation, but they claimed that no one by that name existed in the forum, so they must have hacked the site just to hand out spam mail. In the meantime, Reed did some digging into Necrosleep and found that it had been mentioned on an old gaming forum, where a user claimed to have taken it and managed to get an extremely high score just by staying awake. The mods didn't believe him, so they banned the player for cheating. Several days passed and Reed received another message from Revelation, 
inviting him to necrosleep.net slash backdoor. The page advertised a free 30-day trial of Necrosleep to the person who clicked the link. Since Reed was bored out of his mind, he submitted his mailbox to receive the sample. Five days later, Reed finds an envelope in the mail, advising him to keep the package in a dark place for maximum potency. Inside were 30 suspicious-looking black pills. Reed remembered the doctor from the website and typed his name into Google for further analysis. Surprisingly, there was a whole Wikipedia article on him, detailing how he was a Ukrainian scientist, and that he was involved with an experiment to bring back dead organisms. The attached video showed a dog's severed head, still alive for a short period of time even without its body. After some hesitation, Reed decided to try the pills, and to his pleasant surprise, they actually worked. He was able to stay awake for several days on end and not once felt tired. During one night, as he was clearing out some junk, Reed discovered the symbol of a downward pentagram with a goat's head inside the empty envelope. After posting it, a commenter on the blog informs him that it's actually satanic, which freaks Reed out. He refused to take any more pills, but began to experience increasingly worsening headaches that only ceased once he took another dose of the medicine. Slowly, Reed's mind started to devolve. He hallucinated red eyes in the dark corners of his room, believing it was his cat, though it was sitting on his lap. He became fearful of the outside world, paranoid for reasons he couldn't comprehend. He started worrying about how much food he had left, but was too afraid to leave his own apartment. During this period, Reed began to question his sanity. Every time he resolved to stop taking the pills, a voice in his head would tell him to do so anyways. As the food rations dropped, the whispers grew louder, more malevolent. Knowing this was some sort of side effect of the necrosleep, Reed returned to the website only to find the site's domain was no longer in use. His friends tried to help him, but Reed questioned their loyalty to him and shut himself away from all contact with the world. His mind was in free fall, with his brain filling with graphic, obscene images that Reed was so used to by then that he didn't even care. The final blog post ended with Reed stating he ate his cat and saying that the voices are angry now wanting to hurt him. Several police reports are attached to the forum thread, revealing Reed attacked his worried father, mulling his face completely off. Reed was discovered and quickly gunned down by attending police. An autopsy report showed that his brain had turned black, riddled with holes, with several unknown parasites feasting on it. The pills were analyzed and found to contain several highly addictive substances, human hormones and parasitic eggs. Stored in a cool place to maintain dormancy, once ingested, the larvae would hatch inside a host and invade the brain. The Cuckoo Conundrum in order to focus on his studies, a college student decided to move out from home and live in another state. For the first few years, he felt like he had everything planned out. A new life ahead of him. But from the moment his sister announced her pregnancy through a text message, his outlook started to dwindle. During her baby shower, she received a high-tech baby monitor with a webcam feature on it. After inputting a password, the whole family could watch a live stream of the baby's room from anywhere else in the world. The brother didn't watch the stream for a few months, since he thought it was odd to obsessively watch someone else's kid. Although, when he began developing insomnia from his course studies, he decided to distract himself a little by joining the stream. It was oddly calming to watch, and seeing something so small and precious set his mind at ease. A month later, however, whilst tuning in, the baby shifted as though something disturbed him. For a split second, the user saw a head peer up from behind the cradle bars, before quickly dropping down from sight. Since it was late at night, 
The tired college student thought it might have been his mind playing tricks on him, so he decided it was time for bed. The next day, after visiting a local bar and having a few drinks, he caught another glimpse of the creature on the livestream. It was crawling along the wall, across from the baby's crib, slowly moving closer to the infant. He quickly called his sister, telling her something was in the baby's room, before the creature skittered away and vanished off screen. The sister's husband entered the room, but couldn't find any sign of an intruder. In order to save face with his sister, he claimed it was a rat he had seen. The student decided the best course of action was to catch the creature in the act, so he stayed up all night watching the stream, hovering his fingers over the keyboard to take a screenshot. Several nights later, the fiend made a reappearance. As it hovered over the baby, the user quickly called his sister, but it soon became clear that she had muted her phone to get some sleep. The torso of the thing opened, letting a slimy worm drop onto the newborn's chest, causing the baby to wake up. His little nephew screamed as the worm entered the baby's mouth and slid down his throat. The creature then left as the sister entered the room, having heard the baby's cries and held him close. Because of the events that night, the student believed he had failed to protect his nephew and fell into a deep depression. After losing his job, he moved back in with his family. For a few years, his mind slipped into denial, pushing the horrific events to the far corners of his mind. It wasn't until he was left to babysit his now two-year-old nephew when he saw a small worm slither under the toddler's skin did the memories come flooding back. He posted his nephew's story online, begging for anyone to let him know what he should do next, believing that whatever this thing is isn't his sister's child anymore. He believes he has to kill what used to be his nephew and needs help choosing the best method for removing him from the picture. Anima. Whilst browsing online late at night, a user noticed how his computer seemed to be oddly slower than usual. He realized that his hard drive was completely full. Confused, he turned on his antivirus to scan his computer, hoping to find the culprit. It stated that there were no viruses or malware, but that one file couldn't be scanned due to being corrupted. The user found the file in his System 32, a single document titled Anima. Hovering over the file, there was no information besides the garbled string of letters. The user immediately tried to remove the file, but a standard cannot delete message popped up every time. After several attempts, an option window appeared on the screen, simply stating, stop, with two choices, yes or no. The user clicked yes, and the window closed. The next day, the user did some research on Anima to see if it was some sort of common virus or trojan on other systems, but no mention of it could be found. He decided to experiment with a file, trying to open it in different programs to force a result. Notepad showed a massive wall of text in another language, while for some reason, while using Photo Viewer to access the file, it showed an image of a suburban house. After accidentally clicking off the photo, he returned to it only to see that the image had now changed, with Russian text on a black background. Taking a screenshot of it, he pasted it into MS Paint, but now the photo was different again, this time of a young woman looking directly into the camera. They decided to do this again to see what other images might show up. A retail store, a man looking into a mirror, a gravesite. Suddenly, the next image was English text on a black background, stating firmly, Get out. Switching programs, the user then tried opening Anima in Windows Media Player. It played audio of what seemed to be a Russian family having dinner. Now using VLC Media Player, it showed a video of the man from one of the photos sitting at his computer. As he skipped randomly through the scene, more windows appeared, telling him to stay out, with yes and no prompts again. Every time, the user clicked on no. It caused more and more windows to block its view. 
After having enough of the troublesome program, the user finally clicked yes. Finished with his investigation, the user tried erasing the file again, but the text boxes continued to block his path. Do not. With no luck deleting the file in trash, he instead went through Task Manager instead, only to find that the file was not only taking all of the remaining memory space, but the majority of his RAM. As he prepared to delete Anima once and for all, a final window appeared stating, please no, before the user clicked end process. Almost immediately, his computer returned to normal, speed and function, but the file was still there, now completely empty. Notepad read it as a blank document, the audio was only static, and the photo and video appeared as a black screen. The user finally researched what Anima meant, discovering that it is a Latin word that when translated into English, means soul. The Other Network The Other Network, or PatriotSearch.com, is a hidden online search engine that redirects users to a world of complete nationalism and extreme censorship within the internet. Reports of this phenomenon were first recorded at the abandoned Gwinnett Climate Research Center. Officials claim that the center has not been connected to any power station for over 13 years. Nonetheless, people have witnessed an anomalous internet connection centered around the west wing of the building. It has been reported that a rogue search engine sporadically replaces websites such as Google and YouTube with a seemingly minimalistic web browser. Segments of news generated by the browser discuss a second civil war, fear of terrorism, mass murders, and riots plaguing the world. The only crimes that have been properly investigated involve treason and fraud, leaving all kinds of depraved people to prowl the streets. It had apparently gotten to the point where a few depraved popularists had attained a cult following, such as a website dedicated to the Dockyard Butcher. Photos and videos obtained detail this alternate world as overcrowded, with London filled with shantytown slums, New York City disappearing from the map with no evidence of it past the 90s, and the police force being overtaken by the army. If you do encounter this network, it's best advised you don't stay on it for too long, as some users report mice ceasing to function, pop-ups showing pale, pupil-devoid eyeballs, and downloads from unknown sources spontaneously occurring. It's theorized by a few that this is reconnaissance from the other universe, monitoring whatever threat might be viewing them, even across alternate universes. As of now, the network represents a cruel and malicious shadow of our own internet. Scientists believe that, should alternate universes exist, that it would be almost impossible to knowingly transfer physical objects from one side to the other. Then again, though data is simply electrical impulses, that such a force should be exchangeable between two realities simply paves the way for other, far less desirable visitors. The Gwinnett Council have discussed demolishing the research center, but plans to actually take action have not yet been confirmed. Did you enjoy the video? Why not click the bell icon and subscribe to see more content from us at Tats.videos. And now let's see the creators of this video.